All right. Let's go back to gwas.r. and run some of this code. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so we're going to use the snip asoc package. It's library that in and look at the data that you're going to play with in your homework, the snips data that came with this package. We set up a snip object to hold the data in a way that uh, the functions will recognize. And then we will use the um, association function to do an actual association test for one SNP. So we're going to look at our first SNP, which is named SNP10001. And we're going to ask whether this SNP is associated with case control status. And we're going to adjust for these two covariates, gender and blood pressure. Uh, here is the first bit of the data. We saw this last time. So we have case control status. We have female, male, blood pressure, this protein variable, and then all of these SNPs. We only have 35. This is just a toy data set. For each SNP, the data that we have is the genotype. Uh, okay. So the association function. Let's see the help file for it. carries out an association analysis between a single SNP and a dependent variable, which is our phenotype, in this case, case control status. One of the details that we have to decide on is how to represent or codify or parameterize genotype. For example, SNP1, we have two T's some of the time. We have C and T some of the time. We probably have C and C some of the time. Uh, what are those? Are these factors, categorical variables, where TT is a category, CT is a different category, TC is a different category, and CC is a different category? If I just said, turn this into a factor, that's what I would get. So I would have a separate, I would be allowing for every genotype uh, to have its own effect. But we know that these uh, alleles operate in predictable ways, namely that, uh, for example, homozygous T might turn into a phenotype. Heterozygous C and T might turn into the same phenotype if T was what we call dominant. So if you have one T, you exhibit the T phenotype. And the only way you exhibit the C phenotype is if you have C and C. That'd be one way to characterize or codify phenotype, in which case T and T, we could say, call that one. C and T, call that one too, because it's the same uh, phenotype. And only call C and C zero. So we could turn this into a binary variable, 0 or 1, depending on uh, which of these, if we wanted to treat it like a dominant T. So this model.interaction argument is where we specify how do we want to represent the genotypes. Possible values are codominant, dominant, recessive, overdominant. The default is codominant. Um, in, let's see, which paper were we looking at that had the details? Was it Wigginton? This is the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium paper. This was the overview of GWAS. Let me see if this is in here.
uh, it'll be down in the statistic part, statistics part, association test. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, forgot where I had details on that. Let's come back here. What I'm going to do in this call right here is use the, the default, which is codominant. Um, what does that mean? Oh, I have it here. Okay. So in my comments in the script file, we have to decide on this uh, argument. The first SNP is either a T or a C. So if we said C is dominant, then CT and CC will be C phenotype, and only TT will be the T phenotype. If, it's if C is recessive, it's the other way around. Um, one other option for coding things is log additive over here at the help file. How do I do that? Additive, sorry. So I actually, I don't want model interaction. I want model. This is the one I'm meaning to be talking about. It's the same idea. Do you want a dominant, recessive, or any of these other ones? So model has as its options the same ones we saw a second ago, and it has this additive. If you don't specify the model argument, association is going to give us the results from all of its possible choices. So let's run this and see what comes out. If we wanted the codominant model, here's the results. Um, so codominant. Let's look at dominant. Dominant says that C is dominant. So I think by default it's going to take the lower alphanumeric um, or the lower alphabetical letter and treat that by as the dominant one when we say dominant. So C is dominant, which means that C, C, and C, T are effectively the same thing. They both result in the C phenotype. And TT is the reference group. So it's like we're saying, kind of like control versus treatment. Treat the control as the reference, and we'll compute a treatment effect as a beta coefficient in our regression. All this has done is code the genotypes into zeros for homozygous T and ones for everything else. So these numbers here are, uh, among other things, we have the number of individuals who had this one of these two genotypes. We have the number of individuals who had that genotype. Um, actually, 0, 1. So we have 82. What is the dim? We have 157 individuals. So what are these numbers? 24. 24 what? Let's do table. Let's table um, SNP1's genotypes. I want to see what they are. So SNPs, dollar sign, SNP10001. Table, SNPs, SNP. We have 12 CCs. 53 CTs and 92 TTs. So dominant, where do these numbers come from? Odds ratio, I know what these are. The odds ratio uh, for the comparison group is defined to be one. And odds is P divided by one minus P, and odds ratio is a ratio of those two things. 
since dominant or uh, homozygous T is our reference group, like our beta zero coefficient in the regression model, um, the odds ratio comparing it to itself is one. So it's just not interesting there, it's just one. The one we're interested in is the comparison to the, re the um, reference group. So comparing the others to homozygous T, the odds ratio is 0.65. If you've done logistic regression, your beta coefficients, instead of like in linear regression, the beta coefficients being mean changes associated with a unit increase in your x variable, we have uh, beta coefficients being log odds ratios associated with a unit change in the predictor variable. If you exponentiate that, you get an odds ratio. Here is the odds ratio that we estimated. If this is equal to one, there's no difference at all. So to the extent that this differs from one is what we're looking for. Can we put a p-value on this? Is this equal to one or not? Null hypothesis, this is equal to one. The p-value is right there. We also have a confidence interval. All right. So we do have these different choices for how to codify things. Log additive is down here. And if we did log additive, then uh, I'm not sure which one. Let's say T, let's say CC is going to be, no, it's going to be, I don't know, TT probably coded as the baseline, zero. CT heterozygous is going to be coded as one and CC is going to be coded as 2. So it's like we've taken this categorical variable and turned it into a numeric variable. That's a fairly strong move to make. Who's to say that for like what we're doing here is saying that heterozygous is halfway, it has half the effect essentially as homozygous C. Because by doing log additive, let me write down our model. Our G GWAS association model in this case is log odds for individual i equal to intercept plus um, gender plus blood pressure, plus genotype stuff. If we did the, the dominant model, then what we are saying is that there is uh, beta 3 times an indicator for whether the genotype This is for SNP 1001. Indicator that um, the genotype is either CC or CT, which means for an individual who is, um, let's do CCI or CTI, as in individual I, does he or she have that, though either of those two genotypes? If the individual has homozygous T, then that indicator variable goes to zero, and the model for that individual is just this piece. And in particular, beta zero represents the log odds for a female, gender equal to zero, with blood pressure equal to zero, which is not interpretable. We could mean center blood pressure to make it more interpretable. But beta zero is a log odds for homozygous T. <laughs> um, Codominant, let's talk about that in a second. It is allowing every one of them to have their own. So what you were just saying is not the codominant. What I'm talking about here is the um, 
dominant C model. The codominant model, I think by codominant they just mean everybody, like there's no summarization, there's no dominance or anything. So CC is its own thing, CT is its own thing, and TT is its own thing. If we did that, we would have um, same thing, same thing, same thing, same thing. But over here we would have uh, beta 3 times an indicator of heterozygous plus another indicator for homozygous C. In that model, so, so in this, in the first one, beta 3 is a log odds ratio comparing um, C phenotype to T phenotype. Beta zero is the population log odds. It's weird because we're not doing, usually like linear regression, we would say yi response. In fact, we would say mean response is equal to say beta zero plus beta one times some covariant. In which case beta zero is population mean of y when x equals zero. In logistic regression, beta zero, because this is not a mean anymore, it's a log odds, this is the log odds in the population when everything else, all of the other covariates, equals zero. So the question was, is that why we code it the way we have for the codominant model? Uh, yes. Essentially, in the codominant model, we're just treating the genotype variable as a factor, what we've called a factor in R. It's just a categorical variable. Every Distinct entry is its own category. If you have a categorical variable, a factor, and you want to put it into a model, let's talk linear regression for a second again. We could have a uh, response variable, yi. Um, so suppose, suppose for a second that we have a response, y, and we have a categorical variable, x, that takes, so it's categorical, with three levels, low, medium, high, or something. We could write a linear regression model that would say mean response for individual i is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1. Um, let's say the three levels are 0, 1, 2. We could codify them however we want. If it was a, b, c, just make it, make it 0, 1, 2. We could make the model be expected y is beta 0 plus beta 1 indicator that xi is equal to 1 plus beta 2 times the indicator that xi is equal to 2. In which case, uh, the, the mean response when x is equal to 0 is just beta zero, because that term and that term are both zero. The mean response when x equals one is beta zero plus beta one, because for that individual, this piece turned on, but that one's still off. So that beta one is a comparison between those two. Beta one is uh, a difference in mean response comparing 
x equal 1 to x equal 0. And similarly, for beta 2, beta 2 is a mean change comparing x equal to 2, x equal 2 to the baseline. So mean response when x equals 2 is beta 0 plus beta 2. The beta 1 is not there because that one's off. So that beta 2 is a mean difference. Uh, x equal 2 to x equal 0. That is a way, that's the default way in R to parameterize a categorical variable. So if you have a categorical variable and you, and you treat it as such, it's going to do that. It's going to take the lowest alphanumeric level and treat that as the reference group, baseline group, to which everybody else is compared. There are other ways to do this. You mentioned another one, like minus 1, 0, 1. You could, you could make it so that the every, all three groups have their own effect, where the effects have to sum to 0. If you were to do that, you would have a, a different model. You'd have the exact same conclusions. What's the effect of this group? Whether I do it this way or the previous way, my answer will be the same. Is there a significant effect of this group? My answer will be the same. This is just a different way of parameterizing the model. I could say beta 0 plus beta 1 indicator xi equals 0 plus beta 2 indicator xi equal 1 plus beta 3 indicator xi equal 2. Now I've allowed everybody to have their own effect. The problem now is that there's four parameters, but there's only three groups to estimate them with. This is an over-parameterized model. It's like uh, well, uh, you can't estimate this model until you make a restriction. There's too many parameters. I can make it so there's one less if I restrict under the restriction that beta 1 plus beta 2 plus beta 3 equals 1, uh, 0, sorry. In which case, there's only two of those. Because beta 3, once I know beta 1 and beta 2, I know what it is. So that's an identifiable model. It is exactly equivalent to the previous one. In R, if you're, play, if you're interested in fiddling with those types of things, check out the contrasts function. That might just be contrast. Yeah, it's this one. So if you have a factor, you can change between different ways of parameterizing it. I, I like the uh, baseline group model. That's what I'm used to thinking in terms of control versus treatment. It's a very natural way to, re to represent something. There's a control group, and there is a treatment. What's the treatment effect? But again, p-values and final conclusions will be exactly the same. So uh, back up here, we're doing regression. It's just it's a little bit different because it's logistic regression. Instead of a mean of a continuous variable, we have a log odds because we have a categorical binary response that we really care about. You can't, it doesn't work well to do like um, just zeros and ones linear regression. Doesn't, it's not a sensible thing really to fit a line to zeros and ones. That's why we introduce logistic regression because when you do the log of this odds, you take 0, 1 stuff and you turn it into like real numbers between minus infinity and infinity, for which case it does make sense to do linear models. So output, um, the log additive model, let me finish this uh, comment. Log additive, what we did was say, forget about treating genotype as categorical, treat it numerical. Um, basically saying, so if, if we did that, let me write down the model real quick. So here is the additive model. 
we say the log odds for individual i is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 gender plus beta 2 blood pressure plus beta 3 xi, where xi is equal to 0 if um, the genotype was, I think it's going to pick C, 1 if it's heterozygous, CT or TC, and 2 if it's homozygous, T. So, okay, so what this means is that beta 3, what is beta 3? Up above, beta 3 was, for example, the log odds ratio comparing homozygous T to everybody else or the other way around. And we did the, when we did the codominant model, we would allow for there to be a separate effect, into, you know, untied to the other ones, the, a separate effect for every single into, uh, unique genotype. The effect of heterozygous is such and such. The effect of homozygous T is such and such. Now, we just have one parameter that represents genotype effect. There's not a separate effect for these different groups. The only way that we're allowing for the different groups to have their own effects is by turning them into numbers. So, for example, the um, log odds for, um, let's say, gender I, pick a gender, and pick a blood pressure. So, females with blood pressure 100, something. Log odds for that type of person who has that genotype is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 GI plus beta 2 BPI. XI for CC is equal to 0. So this went away. The log odds for same covariates but genotype um, CTI or TCI is beta 0 plus beta 1 GI plus beta 2 BPI plus beta 3. Because for heterozygotes, it's equal to 1. And now I know what beta 3, I can interpret beta 3. Because beta 3 is just the difference between those two lines. So the diff beta 3 is. Uh, log odds ratio, so it's a difference of log odds. Just like beta in a linear regression is a difference of means, since we're talking now in terms of log odds, that beta is going to be a difference of log odds. A difference of logs is a log of ratios. So this is a log odds ratio for an individual with uh, gender GI, blood pressure BPI, <clears throat> comparing, so comparing, I should have said, this is a log odds ratio for comparing two individuals with the same GI BPI, comparing uh, heterozygous to homozygous C. Log additive model has said CC is our baseline. Beta 3 is the change in the response associated with a one unit increase in X. Usual regression interpretation, holding everything else constant. Changing X by one unit is going from 0 to 1, for example. So this is the log odds ratio comparing x equal 1 to x equal to 0, holding gender and blood pressure constant. Similarly, the um, 
log odds for same gender, same blood pressure, and now homozygous T is beta 0 plus beta 1 And now what goes here? Yes. 2 beta 2. Sorry, 2 beta 3. Because for this genotype, x was coded to be equal to 2. That means that 2 times beta 3 is the log odds ratio holding gender and blood pressure constant comparing heterozygous or homozygous T to homozygous C. Beta 3 is the heterozygous effect. 2 times beta 3 is kind of the homozygous effect. Beta 3, another implication of this model is that beta 3, if we were to write all this out, uh, no, sorry, if we were to compare these two, homozygous T to heterozygous, what's the difference between them? According to the model, what's the difference in log odds comparing same gender, same blood pressure, homozygous T to heterozygous? Yes, it's exactly the same as this one. This comparison looks at that and subtracts off that. So everything's the same, except over here at the end, we have two beta 3s in the latter case. We only have one in the first. So um, I could say equivalently, corresponds, I guess, to um, homozygous T compared to heterozygous. The assumption of additivity has these implications. You're turning your genotype into just a single numerical variable, that's nice because it's nice and simple now. There's just one beta coefficient for us to estimate. If beta 3 is not equal to 0, then we have, we have uh, evidence of association. But we're only going to be able to pick up linear associations. We're not guaranteed that that is the case. There's no guarantee that the heterozygous effect is half of the homozygous effect, for example. Does it seem reasonable to assume that? The paper, I, can't, I thought it was the Bush and Moore one, um, but one of the papers that talks about this claims based on simulation results that have been published that um, the additivity model works pretty well. Even when additivity doesn't strictly hold, it works pretty well. And it is nice in the sense that uh, I only have one coefficient to worry about for each SNP, there's one p-value uh, for that coefficient that I can focus on. That's not really a, a deal breaker, practically, because in these other models, even though there's multiple coefficients that speak to genotype effect or association, it's not hard to test an analogous null hypothesis. You've actually done it before. When you use that negative binomial log likelihood ratio test, you fit a full unrestricted model, and you fit a restricted or um, null hypothesis model. In this case, I could fit this one that has a beta 3 and a beta 4. Both of those have to do with genotype. Is there an association? If so, or I'm sorry, if not, then I can pull both of these out of the model, beta 3 and beta 4. So I could fit the other, another model that does not have them in the model, and, and it's straightforward to get a p-value from that called a likelihood ratio test. 
All right, coming back here, we have used the association function. In your homework, I asked you, I think, to use the additive model. By the way, I can match the above. Let's match the above just to make sure we know what's going on. I'm claiming on the whiteboard that this is logistic regression. That's all we're doing. For the dominant model, for example, let's see if we can match the results. So to do the dominant model, I'm going to make a, uh, a new variable. So I'm going to make a binary variable that's 0 only for the TT genotype and 1 for everybody else. So my covariate, let's call it x. Um, so we have 157 individuals. Let's make x be 157 zeros to start. And then I'll just update all the places where it's not homozygous T with a 1. So SNPs, dollar sign, SNP 10001. Let's look at the first 10. Looks like that. So does the first one equal TT? Yes. Does it equal TC? No. OK. So let's do x where SNPs dollar SNP 10001. x where that is not equal to TT. Anywhere we don't have homozygous T, let's put a 1. So we just codify genotype. Baseline group is homozygous T. Heterozygous is 1. Homozygous C is also 1. Now let's match our model. Um, so I'm going to use, to do logistic regression in R, you can use the GLM function. LM is for usual linear regression with a continuous response. GLM is the generalized version of regression. It does that simple case of regression, but it also does a bunch of other ones. Logistic regression, Poisson regression, um, gamma, several different things. So I want to mimic this. I'm going to write it over here so I don't have to type it into the console. So we did... Um, This, I don't need to write it down, I'm running out of time. Uh, fit is GLM, case control status, tilde, sex plus blood pressure plus X. My data is Y SNP, which is fine, even though X is not in Y SNP, it's going to look in there. And then since it doesn't see it, it's going to go look outside of there, and it will find the x that we just created. The only other thing I have to do for GLM is tell it what kind of model do I want. What kind of generalized model do you want? Linear regression or binomial um, logistic regression or Poisson regression? I do that through the family argument. Possible families include or are, are, are these. And logistic regression corresponds to the binomial choice. Logistic regression, we have 0, 1. That's like a binomial experiment. Some number of yeses, some number of noes. So what we need to do is say family, is it family or model? Family. Family equals binomial. 
And then let's look at the summary of it. Okay, there's the output. Um, I want to match this guy. So I want to match these results right here. <clears throat> this is beta 0 in the logistic regression stuff that we were writing back here. Uh, we're doing the dominant model, dominant C. So beta 0, the estimated log odds for homozygous T when gender is 0, which I think is male actually in this case, and blood pressure is 0, is equal to 4.095. Gender effect, blood pressure effect, genotype effect. So this should be the, if I exponentiate this, this is, or, so looking at this number as itself, minus 0.43, is a log odds ratio. It's a difference of log odds, so it's a log odds ratio. And then if I exponentiate it, it should be an odds ratio. So e to the minus 0 0.4301 is 0.65. And the p-value came out as 0.23 according to association came out as 0.23. So all association is doing is logistic regression for you. The more interesting function is uh, the WG association function. Let me go ahead and run this because it takes a moment, actually more than a moment. We may not have time to see this. It takes a long time. These are a different set of data that come with um, the SNP associ package. The, the first ones that we were playing with were absolutely just a toy data set. There was just 35 SNPs and 157 individuals. When we were reading the Bush and Moore paper, we were saying usually with um, association studies, you need big sample sizes because we're fishing for subtle effects among lots of SNPs. So we would hope to have thousands of people ideally in our case control study, and we're typically going to have a lot more than. 35 SNPs. These data come from the HapMap project. I mentioned that last time. That was a project that went looking for tag SNPs. We don't need all the SNPs necessarily to genotype if many of them are highly correlated with others. If we can pick some that kind of collectively represent a group with which they're highly correlated, we can be more efficient. So here we have some number of thousands of SNPs. I think we have about 9,000 SNPs. And what WG association does uh, is the same thing as association, except it does it for all your SNPs at once. And then it gives you some nice looking output. Association is just logistic regression on a SNP. Think of WG, whole genome association, as calling association repeatedly for all of your SNPs. If we don't have time to run this one, I encourage you to run it and, and have a look at the output. We get a nice picture, for example. So these are data. We have 9,300 SNPs, 120 individuals. 60 of the individuals come from one population. Remember we talked about the different world populations having different genetic uh, characteristics, and in particular, different, ca different patterns of linkage disequilibrium, because the African individuals are older generationally. They've had more time for things to get into equilibrium, whereas Asian and European have had less time. So HapMap and other kinds of association studies like this often will have representatives of distinct populations, because the SNPs that are, net are relevant may be different depending on population. We have 60 from Central European, and we have 60 from Africa. 
the picture. Ah, oh, it happened. Okay. Warnings, bummer. I'll check that later. Here's the picture. You won't get this when you run this on the toy data. You only get this when you do the whole genome, uh, a whole genome analysis where you have your data organized in chromosomes, multiple chromosomes. So these are 22 chromosomes for humans. And if we were to look at, for example, chromosome one, uh, the little bars rising up are indicators of the p-values. In order to make it visually easier to see what you want, because you want small p-values, really small p-values indicate strong association, in this case with case control status. What has been done here is the p-values have been transformed into uh, minus log 10 times the p-values. So really, really small p-values will be really, really big once you minus log transform them. Gray has been coded as p-values that are below, that were deemed to be small, less than, what is this, 1 e to the minus 10 up to 1. Oh, so gray is small, red is big, minus log p-values. Or conversely, red is small p-values. So arbitrarily, by default, the WG association function has said, we're going to look for p-values that are smaller than nine zeros in front of a one. Tiny. Those are shown in red. So qualitatively, you look at the picture, and wherever you see red, that's a SNP that was statistically significantly, and that, I'm going to qualify that in a second, that seems to be associated with case control status. It's interesting that you do see some kind of clustering in some cases, maybe. Like here's a group of SNPs. Um, Maybe in some other cases, there's a group of SNPs. Maybe those are linked to each other. They are in disequilibrium with each other. And so they tend to go together. And so collectively show association. We've talked about multiple testing. So we know better than to put too much faith in raw p-values after we did 10,000 tests. GWAS. Uh, seems like the default with the software that I've played with works with p-values. I don't recommend working with p-values if you really want to be... I, mean, I think FDR is a better choice than p-values. Surely, you know, looking at an extremely small p-value, ze nine zeros in front of a one, that's probably, you know, pretty safe. But if you do 10,000 tests, the Bonferroni correction would say, multiply all of your p-values by 10,000. Um, so you know that these p-values are not as small, not nearly as small as they nominally represent themselves to be. All right, are there questions? Those are the locations of the centromeres in the chromosome. So just basically the center not exactly the center, but um, functionally a center point. Uh, okay, so your homework hopefully is going. Um, the hardest part will be coding up this. It's not that hard, but it will take a little bit of time to code up the p-value calculation for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium question. Watch the Khan Academy videos on, on HWE. It is an equation. There is a fun, there's an equation that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium corresponds to. I don't think it's even in this paper. I think it's just assumed you know what it is. So watch the uh, Khan Academy videos. You need to know what the equation is in order to answer the last question on the homework. Uh, 
So chi-square is an option. One problem with like a chi-square test is that it's, it's based on, um, there's a distributional assumption. This is a, it's called an exact test, which is kind of a non-parametric test. Chi-square, you would be assuming a distribution or a large sample size, not any extreme, like really small number of counts in one group. Um, an exact test says the distribution of counts is binomial. I didn't have to make any assumptions otherwise. You know, zeros and ones, I can count, I can treat them like binomial. So I can exactly compute what is the probability of 10 or more heads out of such and such number of trials when P is so, is so and so. You can just compute it. It requires calculation, but it can be computed exactly. There's something called Fisher's exact test, which is an old test that's been around for a long time, that's a competitor to the chi-square test. And the idea is, especially with small sample sizes in cases where the chi-square is not appropriate, it gets the job done. It's more computationally intensive, but not a problem, practically. Huh? But it's not a problem when you make computer do it. When you make computer do it, yeah. Fisher did not have that option. He was uh, 100 years ago. I don't remember how old. All right. I will see you Friday. <laughs>